Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Ted Halstead. I'm the founding president and CEO of the Climate Leadership Council, and I'm delighted to welcome you here today for what is actually a historic event. The reason why I say historic is because today represents the first time that Republican leaders are putting forth a uh, clear and market-based climate solution. And these aren't just any conservative leaders. As you know, what we have today is a who's who of the Republican establishment, including three former secretaries of treasury, two former secretaries of state, and two former Republican uh, chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors. I'm also delighted that uh, as another co-author of our report, we have the former chairman of Walmart, the world's largest private employer. So together, this is quite a group to put forward this plan. Today also uh, marks the formal launch of the Climate Leadership Council, a group that you will be hearing a lot more from in the months ahead. Um, before turning to our plan, I want to spend a couple moments on two topics. One is the realities of climate change, and the other is our overly polarized partisan politics uh, on this particular issue. Uh, so let me start with the realities of climate change. I think we can summarize with three basic facts where we stand. And the point I want to drive home is that the situation is so much worse than most of the public recognizes. And I will try to highlight that through three simple facts. These are all facts. The first fact is that the overwhelming majority of scientists and every single head of state who was at the Paris Climate Summit recently agreed that the world must limit warming to two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels in order to avoid the worst consequences. So that two degrees of warming is the clear international widely agreed upon red line. The second fact is that on our current course, it is nearly impossible that we will stay within that red line. The best studies indicate that even if all countries abide by their Paris commitments, which is now, as we all know, very much in doubt, but even if they did abide by those commitments, the temperatures would still warm by approximately 3.7 degrees by the end of this century, or nearly double the red line. That, uh, the best study on this is by MIT, but there are numerous that come up with that figure of 3.7 degrees. The final uh, fact that I would point out is that all of the evidence that the whole world now sees of climate change, meaning the melting ice caps, the record temperatures every year, the regular flooding in Miami Beach, these are all the result of what is so far one degree of warming. So if you think about this, we are now at one degree of warming, but by the end of this century, if we continue on our current course, we're heading towards four degrees of warming. And just to make this, just to put this in very personal terms, that is within the lifetime of those who are already born today. I have a young daughter who is almost two years old she will be approximately the age of Secretary Baker at the end of this century. So this, which means she'll be very young at the end of the century. And the reason I point that out is that, you know, this is not some distant future problem. This is a very real current problem. Okay, so despite the urgency of this issue uh, and the importance of addressing it, for so long this issue has been mired in partisan politics. The simplistic view is that Democrats want to solve climate change and Republicans don't. Well, as today's statement, our statement proves that is not true. But actually, the truth is more complicated and more nuanced. And much of the mischaracterization of climate politics in America comes down to, in my opinion, a confusion between means and ends. What I mean by that is that there is widespread agreement among many and probably most Republicans that we want a healthy climate for our children and for our grandchildren. The ends 
are really not in doubt. By contrast, um, what makes Republicans so uncomfortable with climate policy and politics is the heavy-handed regulation that Democrats and the green left consistently push as the main climate solution. From a Republican point of view, that heavy-handed regulation is growth inhibiting, and it uh, undermines the, competitive, the competitiveness of American firms. But what's changed in the last two weeks is that Republicans are now in charge of both the White House and of Congress. So they no longer have to fear the command and control agenda of Democrats or of Greens. Rather, they can focus on a conservative climate solution, and that, of course, is where we come in. Uh, our strong message to Republican leaders is that just as they are finding in the case of health care, it is not enough to repeal the current programs. You also must replace those current programs with something better. And I want to point out, especially for Republicans, the politics of this are very important because repealing the Obama-era climate agenda, if that is the sole climate policy of this administration, it will be wildly unpopular. Polls reveal, recent polls reveal that 64% of Americans care uh, about climate change. 71% of Americans want the country to stay in the, in the Paris Climate Agreement, and an even larger number of Americans favor clean energy. What this points to is that the obvious strategy is one of repeal and replace. Obviously, though, Republicans want a climate solution that is built on the core principles of limited government uh, and free markets. And as you will hear today from my fellow speakers, we believe that our plan is superior in literally every way to uh, the Obama-era climate regulations. Um, we call our plan the conservative case for carbon dividends, which, by the way, for uh, the cameras in the room, anybody can find on the website of the Climate Leadership Council. Um, we call it the conservative case for carbon dividends, but we could have called it the capitalist climate solution. Because basically, it boils down to two things, getting the price signals right and then getting government out of the way. That is, in essence, our plan. As you will see in our document, it has four components. I will quickly summarize them. The first is a gradually rising carbon tax. The second is that 100% of the proceeds would be given back to the American people in the form of dividends. And we say in our paper that they would be quarterly dividends. But at our breakfast meeting, my uh, esteemed co-author said, hey, why not make them monthly? So maybe our plan will evolve to make them monthly dividends. Um, the third key pillar of our program are border carbon adjustments, which are intended to level the playing field, protect the competitiveness of American firms, and encourage other countries to follow suit. And then the final pillar of our program is a significant rollback of existing climate regulations. To be more specific, we believe that the majority of the EPA's current regulatory authority having to do with carbon uh, emissions could be eliminated, including an outright repeal of the Clean Power Plan. As you will hear from my colleagues, there are many upsides to our policies, but I want to summarize it in this way. If you look at the uh, priorities of President Trump, our plan ticks every one of his boxes. It is pro-growth, it is pro-jobs, it is pro-competitiveness, it would balance trade, and last but hardly least, it would be good for working class Americans. I will leave a lot of the details to my colleagues, but I want to focus in my last moments on two unexpected benefits of our policy. The first is that according to the Department of Treasury, 70% of Americans would come out ahead under this plan. In fact, the bottom 70% of Americans would come out ahead under this plan. What that means is that 
223 million Americans stand to benefit financially from solving climate change. And if you'd like to find that policy, again, you'll find that on our website, which is www.clcouncil.org. Uh, a final advantage that I want to mention, thank you. Um, a final advantage that I want to mention uh, is that in the last few days, we produced this study by two leading scholars in the field, one of whom uh, is uh, David Bookbinder, is in the room over, over there. What we asked them to do is to compare the emissions reductions of our plan compared to the new business as usual and all Obama era climate regulations combined. The, the, the findings are quite stunning. What it finds is that our plan would achieve nearly three times the emissions reductions uh, of business as usual, which is defined as an elimination of all Obama era regulations, which as of uh, January 20th is probably business as usual. But more importantly, our plan would achieve nearly twice as much emissions reductions as all Obama era climate uh, regulations combined, which is why we believe that with our plan, the vast majority of those regulations could be safely eliminated. So uh, the final thing that this study found is that with our plan and our plan standing by itself, America could meet the commitments that it made in Paris without any other policies. That is how effective the power of a marketplace solution can be. Um, so to conclude, this is a plan where all Americans can come out ahead, and that is why we believe that a repeal and replace strategy would be the wisest move for the Republican Party. With that, it's a profound honor to introduce uh, my fellow uh, co-authors, and it has been a profound honor to work closely with so many leading lights of the Republican movement in this project. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have three former secretaries of treasury, two former secretaries of state, and two former uh, chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors. If anybody is uh, measuring closely, they would notice that I am double counting. And the reason I am double counting is because there have been only two Americans since the dawn of the 20th century who have served as both Secretary of State and Secretary of Treasury. That would be Secretary George Schultz and Secretary James Baker. Um, and by the way, as if that weren't enough, they each decided to outdo themselves even more. Schultz was also Secretary of Labor uh, under Nixon, and uh, Secretary Baker also in his spare time was Chief of Staff for two Republican administrations. Um, you know, simply put, they just don't make them like this anymore. These are two living gods of public policy and political leadership, and it's been an honor to work with them. Um, I'm sorry that George Schultz cannot be here today because he has been, along with uh, another one of our co-authors, Tom Stevenson, uh, the two of them are partners at the Hoover Institute where they together lead the Schultz-Stevenson Energy Task Force. Well, George and Tom have been uh, my partners in crime in this project since the beginning, and I am deeply grateful to both of them. Um, uh, Secretary Schultz has uh, provided a written statement that will be in your packets, but that um, uh, Secretary Baker has offered to read. And another one of our very key co-authors who cannot be here today, uh, Secretary Hank Paulson, has also provided a written statement that Martin Feldstein will read during his remarks. Uh, with that, I'm uh, deeply honored to introduce uh, Secretary Baker, and I'm also deeply grateful because he has stood up to lead on this issue, and he has also been very helpful in the policy formulation as we moved this, uh, this plan forward. So with that, let me introduce a living legend, a living legend Secretary James Baker. Be careful. <laughs> Be careful, Ted. Thank you and thank you for what you've done to research and promote this proposal. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, later on, uh, as uh, Ted indicated, I'm gonna read to you a short statement from my uh, colleague and friend, George Schultz. 
As many of you probably know, George has always been able to work effectively at the intersection of politics and policy. When he reached out to me last year about this plan, I think he had recognized something with which I quickly agreed, and that is that for too long, we Republicans and conservatives haven't occupied a real place at the table during the debate about global climate change. Instead, we have tended to dispute the fact of climate change, and particularly the extent to which man is responsible for any changes in the Earth's climate. Now, I need, in the interest of full disclosure, to tell you that I was and remain uh, somewhat of a skeptic about the extent to which man is responsible for climate change. But I do think that the, that the risks associated with it, if, they're, if the people who believe it has happened and is going to continue to happen are correct, the risks are too great to ignore and that we need some sort of an insurance policy. And that if we can get an insurance policy that is a conservative approach based on the free market, that limits government, doesn't expand government, and that, and that is competitive internationally, that's a win-win, and we ought to take a look at that. And that's why we're here today. We have no assurance at all that this is going to be something that uh, the administration will uh, grab hold of. We happen to believe that this would help make America great again, but that's our view. We'll see what the administration uh, uh, thinks about it. Uh, we don't need an insurance policy, though, that relies on government regulation as a stick with which to beat our power companies that, uh, that power this country. Uh, and this proposal, as I think Ted has indicated, could lead to the elimination of most, if not all, of those very onerous uh, EPA regulations uh, having to do with, uh, uh, with the use of, uh, with the production of carbon, the use of of, uh, and the production of power in this country, including an outright repeal of the Clean Power Act. Uh, this proposal is essentially revenue neutral. Uh, when I did tax reform uh, for Ronald Reagan back in 1986, it was a real slog. Uh, we're talking about tax reform today. Uh, I don't know whether we can get it done again or not. We, it was the only time it had been done in 100 years. And we would never have been successful if it hadn't been done on a, uh, on a revenue neutral basis. If you get it wrapped up around, all wrapped around the axle of the budget debate, you're not going to get anything done. This is revenue neutral. Uh, uh, many of the companies which are responsible for the production of greenhouse gases, including four of the, of the world's six largest oil companies, have now supported the idea, in one way or another, of a carbon tax. I don't want to see our proposal characterized as a carbon tax, even though that is included in it. This is a proposal for carbon dividends to the American people. And that's going to be, I think, the beauty of, of it in terms of trying to build uh, public support for it. I was a big uh, supporter and still am of our new Secretary of State who is sitting in the chair I used to sit in on the seventh floor of the State Department, Rex Tillerson. He ran, uh, he ran uh, one of the world's largest corporations and perhaps the, the biggest, uh, as far as I know, uh, oil and gas company in the world. And he has demonstrated his uh, managerial uh, abilities and his negotiating abilities, and I think he's going to be a terrific Secretary of State. But here's what he said some time ago. He said, replacing the hodgepodge of current largely ineffective regulations with a revenue neutral carbon tax would ensure a uniform and predictable cost of carbon across the economy. It would allow market forces to drive solutions. It would maximize transparency. It would reduce administrative complexity. It would promote global participation and easily adjust to future developments in our understanding of climate science as well as the policy consequences of these actions. Supporting such an approach is not only responsible public policy, I happen to think it is also good politics. As Ted has said, polling indicates today that some 64 to 60, 
6% uh, of all Americans worry uh, to some degree or another about climate change. And demand for a response to this is growing in this country uh, and around the world. So whether you really believe it as a fact, as Ted does, or, have, or think it can be debated, as I do, I think you need to take a look at the consequences uh, of it if, if Ted is right, uh, because they would be dire. And therefore, we ought to have some sort of an uh, insurance policy. I think this plan does put America first. It allows our party, our political party, to lead from the high ground on a challenge that is critical and that faces all of us, in my view. Now, I want to read uh, to you from uh, a, a statement. Uh, I want to read a statement to you that my friend George uh, Schultz sent us. I'm sorry I cannot be with you at the National Press Club today, but I am delighted to take part in this formal launch of the Climate Leadership Council and to be co-author along with several of my longtime friends of this important new report on carbon dividends. Carbon dividends. This is a program for carbon dividends. There's a carbon tax buried in there somewhere, but this is a program on carbon dividends. Make sure you understand that. And every American is going to get a dividend quarterly from the taxes that are collected uh, on, on the production of carbon. George goes on to say, I like market solutions. Markets bring informed views on various sides of any transaction, and they generally produce op optimal solutions. The carbon tax puts a price out there that levels the playing field among competing sources of energy and then lets the park, uh, market pick the winners. The revenue neutral aspect of our plan means that there will be no fiscal drag on our economy. In that sense, it is really not a tax, this is George, since no money stays with the government. Rebating the carbon tax proceeds through dividends means that the great majority of Americans will be economically better off <laughs> under our plan than they are today under the onerous regulatory regime uh, that, that we face. Massive amounts of physical evidence attest to the reality of climate change, says George, and the main cause seems to be increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the air. To the extent that anybody has doubts about the cause, they should consider the potential consequences, and they should follow President Reagan's approach to the depletion of the ozone layer. When, when, uh, when George and I were serving President Reagan, he advocated for an insurance policy, much as we're advocating today an insurance policy against the depletion of the ozone uh, layer. As it turned out, the scientists who were, who were worried at that time about that depletion turned out to be right, and Reagan's Montreal Protocol came along just in time. So we argue that we ought to substitute a carbon tax for the raft of regulations and subsidies that now characterize this issue. For the sake of our children and grandchildren, I believe, it, I believe it is imperative that we set forth a climate solution that embodies long-standing conservative principles and can return the Republican leadership to a constructive stance on this critical issue. Thank you all very much. We're going to hear from, uh, from Marty. Um, thank you so much, Secretary Baker. I forgot to uh, promote ourselves this morning, which is, for somebody in my position is rare. Uh, we had a great morning, as you may have seen. We had uh, lead op-eds in both the Wall Street Journal written by S Secretary Schultz and Secretary Baker, and an op-ed in the New York Times written by um, our two esteemed economists who I'm about to introduce and myself. Uh, not a bad start for a day. So um, with that, you know, if you asked uh, just about anybody in the conservative movement, who are the two most respected conservative, conservative economists in America today, it would be Martin Feldstein and Greg Mankiw. No doubt. And I am not going to wager as to which of them is the most respected. I'm just going to say that they're both the two most respected. And it's been a profound honor to work uh, with the two of them. Um, 
Marty is, of course, the, the senior most, having uh, served as a chair of uh, the Council of Economic Advisors under Reagan, and he has continued since that time to be amazingly prolific on a whole range of issues. It's an honor to have him as part of this group. Uh, Marty, over to you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have this opportunity. I want to explain briefly why I favor combining a carbon dividend financed by a carbon tax, why I think it is a better way than others of reducing carbon dioxide. A carbon tax is just simply the, the simplest and economically most effective way to reduce the level of carbon emissions that contribute to global warming. It's better than the more cumbersome method of regulation that we now use. It's also simpler and much more reliable than the so-called cap and trade method. The strategy of a, the strategy, thank you, sir. The strategy of a carbon tax is very simple. Require each household and each business that causes carbon dioxide emissions to pay a tax in proportion to the volume of emissions that they create by using gasoline to drive a car or to heat their home or to operate a business. Such a tax gives them the incentive to change behavior, to change behavior in ways that reduce the volume of carbon emissions for example, by driving less or by driving a more fuel-efficient car, or for a business by using a more fuel-efficient technology. A carbon tax would be levied indirectly by taxing the raw material at the point at which it enters the economy. Oil at the refinery, coal where it's produced, and so on. The tax at the source is then built into the prices of the products made from that raw material. So individuals and businesses uh, experience the carbon tax without the inconvenience of paying a tax at each transaction. Different types of carbon raw materials provide very different amounts of carbon dioxide. For example, coal. Uh, is much more CO2 producing than natural gas. So the carbon tax at the source would vary by the, the uh, type of raw material. Experts on the science of carbon can tell the Congress how much to tax each type of carbon in order to achieve a tax equal to, say, $40 per ton of CO2 or whatever the desired level may be. So the practical problem of implementing a carbon tax is and has been political. No one wants to pay an extra tax. But combining that tax with the carbon dividend, which is the unique and most important feature of this proposal, combining it with a carbon dividend means that most, indeed about two-thirds of American households, according to a study done by the staff of the Treasury, will receive more in carbon dividends than they pay indirectly in carbon taxes. Let me say that again, because it's so central to the political support, the potential political support for this idea. Most Americans, about two-thirds of all Americans, will receive more in the form of a cash carbon dividend than they pay indirectly in the form of carbon taxes. So they are net financial winners. So it's a good idea. It's an idea that would work, and it's an idea that should be politically supported. Um, let me now read a brief statement from um, uh, Hank Paulson uh, in which he writes the following. He says, I have long believed that climate change poses an unacceptable risk to our environment as well as to our economy. 
We must take steps to prepare for what is likely to come, and importantly, to reduce the risks of the worst outcomes. Doing so, says Hank Paulson, is an absolute necessity. The, proposed, the proposal unveiled today provides a clear path forward, and I am delighted to support it. Putting a price <clears throat> on carbon is by far the most efficient and effective way to reduce emissions, and it will accelerate investment in the industries of the future. Combine this with pro-growth actions that improve U.S. competitiveness and help working class Americans, and you have an economic policy that warrants widespread support. Those are Hank Paulson's words, but I completely agree with them. And as he says finally, as the title of this paper suggests, this is a fundamentally conservative plan, one that showcases the principles of free market and limited government. I am a proud Republican and believe it is important to protect those principles and to always strive for evidence-based policy making. This plan, Hank Paulson says, provides the roadmap to do just that and I hope will serve as a guide for policymakers going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Marty. And finally, uh, last but not least, is Greg Mankiw. Uh, at breakfast this morning, we were joking with him about how uh, most professors do not make a lot of money um, by writing textbooks. The exception is if you write the textbook that is the most popular uh, and widely read and widely used economic textbook in the land. And that would be a distinction of Greg Mankiw, who also, I want to point out to everybody, um, is the creator of a uh, fairly unique club called the Pagu Club um, that you will find on Google. It's named, of course, after Arthur Cecil Pagu, uh, who first came up with the idea of taxing externalities. And on it, you will find a really interesting beyond left and right crowd of leading um, uh, politicians, businessmen, and intellectuals who support the idea of a carbon tax. Um, so uh, my new friend, Greg Mankiw. Uh, thank you. It's a great um, honor and delight to be here. In my 30 years as a career as an economist, I've had a lot of distinguished co-authors, but never as group as distinguished as this one. So I'm really uh, very happy to be here. Um, if you reporters call your favorite three or four economists, just choose your favorite three or four, and ask them, what do you think about the idea of putting a price on carbon? My guess is that all of them, or, and certainly a vast majority of them, would say, yes, that's absolutely the right way to deal with climate policy. There is a complete consensus among economists that putting a price on carbon is the right, is the right thing to do. And this is economists from the left, from the right, and the middle. It's really a, a, really a, consensus, a consensus view. And so what I want to do today is try to, try to explain uh, to you um, why, it, why it's such a consensus view among economists. And I want to sort of emphasize two broad principles. The first broad principle that you've all sort of learned in what we call an Act 10 at Harvard, maybe Econ 101, where you come from, is that decentralized market economies work better than centrally planned economies. You see that comparing the Soviet Union uh, to the United States. You see it comparing East and West Germany. You see it comparing North and South Korea. I don't think there's any debate now that centrally planned economies don't work very well. Now, you th now think of how that lesson applies to climate change. The regulatory approach, the command and control approach, is basically taking the te techniques of centrally planned economies and saying, oh, well, they don't work generally, but they're going to work here. And I think what we're going to learn is that, no, they're not going to work very well here. Just as they're costly when you try to run a whole economy in a con command and control way, it's going to be very costly if you try to control carbon emissions in a command and control way. And the reason is really pretty simple, which is that th the way in which we impact the climate it's through a many, many, many decisions as we go about our lives. So think about your personal carbon footprint. How do, how, do, how do decisions you make every day affect your carbon footprint? Well, you have to decide what kind of car to drive. You have to decide where you're going to live, so therefore how far you're going to commute. You have to decide whether to carpool with your neighbor to work. You have to decide whether to take public transportation. You can decide what size house to live in. Once you buy the house, you can decide whether to 
to uh, change the windows to, to, to more fuel-efficient windows. There's, li there's literally hundreds of decisions that you're going to face throughout your life that's going to affect your carbon footprint. Well, if we're going to try to make those decisions correct ones via command and control, the government's going to have to go in there and micromanage your life to a degree that no cannot possibly work in a free society. So you realize that any sort of command and control is going to leave lots of decisions unaffected and therefore not be the most efficient way of dealing with that. So what's the most efficient way of dealing with that? Well, let's go away from the centrally planned solution to the decentralized market solution. How do markets work? Markets work by getting prices right, giving people the right set of incentives, and saying, fine, you make the decision. Now that you face the right set of incentives, you decide whether to carpool to work. You decide what kind of car to drive. You decide whether to replace your windows. And what carbon pricing does is it gives people the right incentives. It then makes a lot of the micromanagement unnecessary. We can now sweep away those regulations because people are now incentivized to do the right thing uh, given the, the right price of, of carbon. So it's basically moving away from a command and control centralized approach to a decentralized market-based approach where we trust individuals to make the right decisions once they face the right set of incentives. So that's sort of the first big, big lesson that I want to sort of leave you with. The second big lesson of economics, I believe, is that uncertainty is bad. Now, some uncertainty is a fact of life. We can't do away with all uncertainty. But generally, people don't like uncertainty for good reasons. It's very hard to make long-term plans in the face of uncertainty. And while we can't eliminate all uncertainty, one thing we can eliminate is uncertainty driven by policy. To the extent that policy is the source of uncertainty, that's something we can try to minimize. Well, right now, we have a situation where we have a regulatory left and a deregulatory right, where the left wants to micromanage all these decisions in order to reduce our carbon footprint. The right says, my gosh, it's taking too big a toll on economic growth. Let's deregulate and not worry about climate change. Let's worry about promoting economic growth. If that's the, the situation we're going to leave ourselves with, then we're going to lurch back and forth between regulation and no regulation, and we're going to increase uncertainty going, the, in the, going forward because you know, who knows who's going to be president, what party is going to control the presidency in 10, 20, 30 years. That makes long-term planning um, all, all the more uh, difficult. So, so what can we do? Well, we need sort of some sort of compromise that, on the one hand, deals with the environmental problem, but doesn't do it in such a heavy-handed way that when more conservatives come in, they don't look at this and say, oh my gosh, this is killing economic growth. We need to move away. We need, so we need something in the middle that's going to both deal with the environment, but do it with a light enough touch that people are not going to worry about the impact on economic growth. And I, that's what I think is the brilliant part of this policy. It should appeal to both environmentalists who are worried about climate change and libertarians who want to get government out of people's lives. Uh, and I think it'll be good for both those groups, as well as, of course, as been as emphasized here, many, many Americans who are going to get these carbon dividends that are, that, are, that are going to result from putting a price on carbon. So I think for those two big reasons, moving to a decentralized system and reducing policy uncertainty, this is good for the economy. Now, one of my favorite words when I read uh, journalists is the word panacea. You guys use the word panacea a lot. And if you ever notice when you use the word panacea, there's always a not with it. This is not a panacea. Nothing ever is a panacea. Everything's not a panacea. Well, this is the closest thing I know to a panacea. It solves lots and lots of problems at once. You have a vast majority of policy wants to say, this is the way to go. And the only thing that's step standing in our way is to convince our leaders, and in, and in particular, the, the American public, that this is the way to go. That can leave them and the, environment and the future uh, descendants who are going to inherit the environment better off. So maybe it's not a complete panacea, but it's as close to one as I've ever seen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we have about 20 minutes for our questions. And uh, please raise your hands. I believe we have microphones to, uh, to go around the room. If you can identify yourself, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, uh, I would ask, though, that uh, we, well, let's, let's go with the first question over here. Hi, uh, Eric Wolf with Politico. I'm, with all due respect on sort of this contrast between a regulatory regime versus the carbon tax, Democrats love a carbon tax. Senator Schatz and uh, White House introduced a carbon fee, not just like yours, but they introduced one in 2015. Democrats are not really the problem if, you're, if your issue is to try and solve carbon, uh, excuse me, climate change. Senators 
Cruz and in <coughs> excuse me, and Inov are not interested in that, don't really see this as a problem. What is your plan for dealing with the politics of this issue? Are you going out on the Hill? Are you lobbying? How are you addressing that issue? Thank you. Uh, let's start with uh, Secretary Baker. Uh, well, we're going to the White House as soon as we uh, finish this press conference without any uh, preconceived notion about where they may come down on this. But this makes such good sense from a conservative, limited government, free market, uh, a, a pro competitive approach that uh, at the very least, we hope they'll take a look at it. We believe they will. It's a, it, it, <laughs> it may be a panacea. I like that uh, word, Greg. But uh, we, know we, have a, we know we have an uphill slog to, uh, to get uh, Republicans uh, interested in this. But when you, when you give them the, uh, the option of getting rid of things like the clean power plan, maybe even tort liability uh, for, uh, uh, in this area, stuff like that, uh, there's going to be some appeal uh, to, to some conservatives. Uh, I'm not at all sure. I don't know where uh, you mentioned Senator Cruz. I don't know where Senator Cruz is on this, but but uh, I think there I think there are a lot of people uh, out there in my party who uh, are responsible and reasonable and will take a look at this. And it, it's our hope that they'll take a good, long, hard look at it and that they will uh, realize the wisdom of it and the fact that uh, try. Coming up with a conservative free market approach uh, is is a very a Republican way of uh, of approaching the problem. That's all uh, I can tell you. To, to add to that, I mean, of course, there's the um, external story told about the views of members on on Capitol Hill, but behind the scenes, there is a lot of interest among Republicans in finding an elegant, proactive solution. And in fact, you know, there's talk about looking for the right opportunity for a Republican climate jailbreak strategy. And so we believe that this is the best conservative climate answer. And whether or not it will be adopted in the next two or four years, we cannot tell you. But we can tell you this. The climate problem is not going away. This is by far the best solution. And we think that with our concerted efforts, this will become the inevitable climate solution. We cannot tell you when, but we can tell you that eventually this country has to deal with this issue, and we think that our uh, solution will be front and center. Next question, now, now, please. Let me, wait a minute. Let me finish by saying most of the opposition to this has been, on the Republican side, has been that it constitutes another tax. Uh, I work for the I work for the man, and so did Marty Felstein, who, to whom taxes were anathema, uh, and uh, and he was quite right about it a lot of times, <laughs> most of the time, almost all of the time. But this is not a tax in that sense. It does not grow government. It is rebated dollar for dollar to the American people, and there's going to be some benefit, specific material benefit in it for each American citizen. So uh, you can't look at this as a tax, even though the word carbon tax is used. Thank you. Uh, please. Hi, Jack Fitzpatrick at the Morning Consult. Uh, first, could you clarify uh, who exactly you're meeting with at the White House today? Uh, and, and second, I'm curious who you uh, think sort of the first point of contact is that can get the ball rolling on this and who you have to persuade uh, to take this up? Is it, is it lawmakers in Congress? Do you think the president himself is, is going to delegate this to advisors? Is the vice president maybe the, the lead person? Well, we're going to meet, we're gonna meet uh, with Gary Cohn, who's the president's uh, chief economic advisor and head of, I think, the National Economic Council. Uh, beyond that, I can't tell you who we're going to meet with. We'll find out after we get there. You'll find out after we get there. Uh, in terms of where the leadership ought to come from, it's, uh, I'm a creature of the executive branch. It's always been my view that the president uh, needs to lead uh, in our democracy if we're going to get if we're going to get anything done. Uh, and so, I, I think we have to have the support of people on the Hill. Yes, but I think uh, it would really be important as well to get the executive branch on board if we can. 
We make no claims about whether we can or not, but this is a really sensible, reasonable, moderate, conservative, free market, limited government approach to this problem. So it ha ought to have some appeal. Um, and just one additional point on that. Um, uh, our understanding is that we're meeting with uh, a number of senior officials at the White House, though it would be premature to say uh, which, but it will be a number of senior officials. Um, question over there. Uh, yes. Uh, well, you know, our economy is addicted to carbon. Can you keep your question short, please? Sure. It's, no it's statements. Michael questions. Michael Bischecker, the Associated Press. Thank you. Our economy is addicted to carbon. First step of recognizing you have an addiction is admitting you have a problem. Overwhelmingly, Republicans in Congress and the President say they don't believe climate change is real, that they don't believe that it has a man-made call. The President has called climate change a hoax. Mr. Baker even says he's skeptical. What is the evidence that you would hope to present to Republicans to get them to switch their positions and admit we have a problem? Um, just to be clear, if you listen carefully to all of the uh, testimonies, um, even from those who, you know, the media likes to say are the, the main skeptics, there was consensus. They all said, we have a climate problem. Uh, they went on to say that there are some questions about uh, what degree uh, of it is man-made, meaning is it 90 percent, is it 80 percent, is it 70 percent? But if you listen carefully, there wasn't disagreement about the fact that we have a climate problem. And as uh, Secretary Schultz said in, in, in the, the comments that were read, I mean, just look around. It's everywhere. I mean, I just want to tell you one very uh, small anecdote. I, I have a friend who just came back from Bolivia. This story has not been in the media. Um, this, this friend of mine spent a month in La Paz. Well, guess what? La Paz has always had water from glacial lakes. Those lakes are now so dried up that there was no water for an entire month in the entire city of La Paz, literally. I mean, and these stories are coming from everywhere in the world, so it's just undeniable that we have a problem. And I think, again, that we all want to move to what is the optimal solution as opposed to, um, you know, talking forever about the certainty on the problem. Please. Uh, first, second, let's take two questions in a row because we don't have that much time left. Yeah, um, Doug Obi with Inside EPA uh, Climate. Uh, two very quick questions. Um, you mentioned that there might be some regulations. You said the vast majority of the regs could go away, but may, implying that maybe some might not uh, in exchange for doing a carbon tax. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what regulations might still be needed. Uh, and also, um, uh, the uh, report on the, the trade between regulation and carbon tax seems to cover uh, up to 2025 pretty well and looks on the surface like a possibly good deal for environmentalists, but it doesn't really discuss post-2025 and 80% 2050. How does this tax um, establish an insurance yes. policy for that? So uh, to, to answer both of those quickly, um, there are certain areas in economics uh, where there is an asymmetry of information. So the easiest example is appliance standards. Um, the party that typically buys the appliance, let's say a landlord, is not the party typically that uses that appliance, which means that the cost signal does not transfer through. The, the, the person buying wants the cheapest, the person using wants the most efficient. So there, that's a case where the regulation sh should stay. As for the study, um, it's through 2025 because that's our commitment to, uh, to Paris. But a very key pillar of our plan is that what would sustain this program for the long term is the popularity of the dividends. And there we would point you to the case in Alaska where a Republican governor passed a plan there where all Alaskan citizens get dividends. It's from a different source, a source that is actually contrary to what we're talking about here. But it shows the Republican uh, roots and the popular dividends. Every time that there have been efforts to play around with that uh, dividend in Alaska, it has been shot down. It's become the third rail of politics. So our premise is that the popularity of the dividends would ensure the longevity of the policy and create comfort around the elimination of all these regulations. Please. 
Jennifer Deloy, Bloomberg News. On, on the dividend issue, I understand that's the centerpiece of your plan, and, and if you get it in place before uh, a fundamental tax reform, maybe it can't be touched because it's politically undoable. But if this is wrapped up in some kind of broader tax overhaul, if that's your opportunity, how do you keep lawmakers from looking at this as a big pot of revenue that can be used to lower the corporate tax rate to do other things other than the send way, quarterly the, checks? The way you do that is to pass laws that say this is what's going to happen to these funds. And, and uh, if, if, if anybody fails to follow through on those laws, you have access to the courts. That's the, way we, that's the way we do everything in this country, and we're doing it right now, for instance, with respect to the travel ban. So we are a country of laws. When we pass, this is going to be, to make this work, it has to be legislated. And any, and any government uh, officials who don't want to comply with what the law says are answerable uh, in court. That's how you do it. And to be clear, I mean, we imagine a tax starting at about $40 and growing every year over time. The public will not support its continual rise if there is not the dividend. That, that is what makes, that is the glue that ties all this together and makes it possible. Um, we have a uh, next question here, please. Thanks, Evan Lehman with e, e News. Did you ask to meet with President Trump, and are you holding out the possibility, that possibility today? Um, and on EPA authority on greenhouse gases, do you, would, would the plan require the elimination of the underlying authority from EPA to regulate greenhouse gases? As far as I'm concerned, it ought to require that. Yeah, I think it should. I, I don't know whether it has written whether today whether it does. And we did not ask to meet with President Trump. At least I didn't. Uh, I've met with him, and if he would, if he was available, it'd be great. We'd love to meet with him too. But we didn't ask for that. Um, uh, next question, please. Hi, uh, Evan Halper at the Los Angeles Times. Can uh, you just explain how how Paris fits in with this plan? if um, you're going to raise the Paris Accord when you uh, go to the White House today, and also, uh, Mr. Secretary, the um, sort of the risks of withdrawing from the, the Accord uh, for our global standing. I didn't understand the last part of your question, but with respect to the Paris Accord, <clears throat> our plan is consistent with it, and it would comply with, uh, with the United States' commitment under the Paris Accord, as I understand it. Uh, what was the last part of your question? Just as a, as a former Secretary of State, when you withdraw from an accord like this, what does it do uh, to our global standing? We're from the Paris Accord? We're not withdrawing. We're, we're, not, we're, withdrawing. we're not withdrawing. We're not proposing we're, to we're withdraw. Not withdraw. No, I understand that, but, the Trump, uh, but President Trump has talked a lot about withdrawing, and if he goes through with that, uh, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> there's no penalty for withdrawing, okay? So it's not a treaty in that sense, and if it were uh, sufficiently important, it would seem to me they would have, uh, and, and they could get it done, they would have made it a treaty. But it's not a treaty. It's not that there's no enforcement re requirements in it. On the other hand, uh, the cost in terms of our global standing would be quite uh, considerable. And again, what we're offering to the Trump administration is a very appealing plan that meets many of their other policy objectives so that there's no need to withdraw or, or undermine the, the, the Paris Accord. And just to be very candid, in our talk with the, with the White House today, we believe that if they buy into this plan, it will not be for its climate merits, it will be for all of its economic and political merits. So, you know, that's the, the beauty of having a panacea. Uh, question over there. Simone Frank from the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. But beyond your trip to the White House, what are your plans for this, this organization going forward, and how are you going to implement your, your plans? Thank you. Um, so uh, the question is about the future of the Climate Leadership Council. I mentioned earlier that this is our formal launch today. Well, actually, we're going to have a two-part launch. This is part one. In approximately two to three months, we're going to have a second major launch event at which we're going to announce 20 founding members of the Climate Leadership Council, including most of the co-authors of this paper, which is a fantastic starting point. But we're also talking to a number of other leaders, especially business leaders and so forth. And collectively, and there'll be some international leaders as well, and we'll have a very, very big event 
I would imagine, full page ads and so forth. And that will be announcing the 20 founding members. And that will be in, uh, in April or uh, May. And uh, speaking of supporters out there, uh, a note was handed to me about this uh, earlier. Um, uh, Governor Romney was one of the first to tweet uh, in favor of our plan, um, which uh, you will find online, and we're getting a lot of interest there. We have time for one last question before we need to go, and it is for you, sir. Hi, Zach Warmbrot with Politico. Uh, my question is for Secretary Baker. Um, Stephen Mnuchin is going to be confirmed in the next few days as the next Treasury Secretary. Have you had a chance to talk with him about that job, or do you have any advice as he goes into the office? I haven't had a chance to talk with him about that job. Uh, I have talked to uh, Rex Tillerson at some length about the, the job that he now has, and uh, but I haven't talked to Steve Mnuchin. Uh, I think he's going to make a good Treasury Secretary once he gets confirmed. Uh, we're seeing a lot of slow walking going on up there in terms of confirmations. We've, I don't think, I can't remember an instance where we've ever seen that before, where we have to take uh, 30 hours of, of debate with each and every nomination. That doesn't seem to me to be in the best interest of the United States of America. Uh, with that, we need to wrap up. I should say um, we have never done this presentation together as a foursome, but uh, it went well enough that, gentlemen, I'm ready to go on the road with you whenever you want to. Um, and I would also point out that um, on the website of the Climate Leadership Council, you will find a lot of additional information on this topic. I encourage you to visit it. Thank you all very much for coming.